Ready for the political season to ramp up again? We're four months out from Election Day, which means the race for Oregon's next governor is starting to get heated. So who's leading in the polls? Well, it depends on which campaign you ask. So it's natural, I think, for folks to say, hey, what's going on here? Uh, you know, is, is this real? Is there a thumb on the scale from the individual candidates? And we may have found the one thing that unites the Democratic and Republican parties in Oregon. Attacking unaffiliated candidate Betsy Johnson for claiming legislative immunity after a car crash. Here's the story. I'm Pat Doris. Welcome to the story. All the ways to communicate with us right there at the bottom of your screen. You could email us. The address is the story at kgw.com. You could use the hashtag the story kgw on Twitter or leave a voicemail. Call our phone number 503-226-5090. One of the fun things about doing this show is we all get to learn together. Tonight, we're going to dig into the world of political polling, specifically around the race for governor in Oregon. The goal is for you and me to come away with new skills, to be able to look at polls in the future and know which ones are likely pretty accurate and which ones are pretty much BS. And by the way, the information is helpful whether you're in Oregon or anywhere else in this great big world. To guide us along the way, we have John Horvick. He's a senior VP at DHM Research. That's a polling company in the Portland area. But, and this is important, they never do work, he tells me, for a specific candidate or campaign. So he knows the business and he's willing to share. My first question to him involved recent polls put out by the candidates for governor. The first, conducted in late May by Nelson Research, showed Republican Christine Drazen leading the way with 30% of likely voters saying they would pick her. Democrat Tina Kotek came in second place with roughly 28 percent and unaffiliated candidate Betsy Johnson came in third with roughly 22 percent. And by the way, all the polls I'm mentioning tonight do have undecided voter percentages. And yes, I'm ignoring that percentage for this story. All right. Another poll paid for by Johnson's campaign and conducted June 23rd through the 25th showed her doing much better. Who knew? With Kotek in the lead at 33%, Johnson in second place at 30%, Drazen coming in third at 23%. And yet a third poll, conducted June 28th through the 30th, paid for by Republicans, found Drazen in first place with 32.4%, Kotek in second, 31.4%, and Johnson in third place again with 24.4%. So, here's a question. How can three polls show such different results? especially for Betsy Johnson, who somehow came in second only on the poll that her campaign paid for. Well, let's turn to John Horvick for answers. So it's natural, I think, for folks to say, hey, what's going on here? Um, you know, is, is this real? Is there a thumb on the scale from the individual candidates? And, you know, there is reason for some skepticism. Um, but I think if we sort of look at the different pieces, there's also some consistency, and that's who's at the top right now. May not be predictive what's going to happen in November, but but that's an important, I think, takeaway as well. Okay. And what sort of uh, tricks or techniques do pollsters use to somewhat tip the scales? Well, I don't know if that's happening, but here's the challenge that any independent poll or a candidate poll is going to run into right now is that we don't know what the turnout is going to be like in November. And you, every pollster is going to have to make some judgments about modeling that electorate. What, what proportion of the electorate is going to be Republicans? What's going to be Democrats? What's going to be non-affiliated? What's the breakdown on age, area of the state? All those things can make a difference in who you sample and therefore what the results are going to be. There's not necessarily one best way to go about doing that, particularly when we're several months out from the election. And so the Johnson campaign can make potentially could make legitimate sort of arguments that I think my campaign is going to unfold this way. I'm going to be able to turn out these voters and therefore the electorate's going to look like something that's more favorable to me. And the Drazen campaign or the Kotech campaign could also make similar sorts of claims about what they're going to be able to do to encourage their voters to turn out. So did you get that? The pollsters have to look into their crystal ball and make an educated guess on which people will actually show up and vote in November, and then try to find people just like that to see who they would go for right now. And the results will change depending on who you ask. 
For example, ask a bunch of Democrats in Portland and they may say Tina Kotek is their pick. But Democrats in more conservative parts of the metro area may not say that in my hypothetical example. Who you contact makes a big difference in the outcome of a poll. And right, exactly. So you might say, like, you know, t historically in a in a midterm general election, turnout among Republican or Democrats is is about eighty percent. But you might say, hey, I've raised a lot of money, I've got a really strong message, and I got good ground game. So I think turnout's going to be a little bit more than what's been in the past. That's a that's a bit of a judgment call by the candidate and the pollster to then model their sample with that assumption built in. And then another candidate might say the same about them. But it's going to make a difference if one candidate polls more Democrats and the other one polls more Republicans, even if they have a good case to make. It's going to influence what the final result is in the poll. That's why it's so critical to show people who you talk to so that they can make an independent judgment about whether or not they think that that poll is ac accurately reflecting what turnout is going to be in November. Is there best practices? Should it be 50 percent? You know, should it be equal on both sides? No, it should. You should try to get as close to what you think is what the turnout is going to be. And you, know, you can look at past history. You can ask people in your survey, you know, how excited are you to vote? Or uh, you can look at people who have only voted uh, in the past. So look at people who have, have a past history of voting. There are different tools that pollsters can use. They have some trade-offs and they have some, um, you know, research to sort of support using them. But it isn't it isn't the case that there is just one way to go about it. Uh, and you know, just being transparent about it, uh, transparent what the limitations are, transparent what your assumptions are, transparent what you did. Um, and if you want your survey to be taken credibly, uh, then you should show that stuff. So again, who you sample, that means who you call or text or contact as part of the survey. Who is that person willing to answer the questions? Super important. One of the challenges, and I think a reason for uh, you know voters and news consumers to have some most well, skepticism of what they're seeing right now, particularly from candidates, is do they show you who they sample? And if they don't, then you really should take those results with a grain of salt and say, hey, you know, maybe that candidate is using these results as much to shape the narrative about the about the election, about this campaign, then it is a true reflection of where the voters are at today. Now we're getting somewhere. If you see a poll that comes from a campaign and you cannot find the information about who they sampled, which sometimes is the case, feel free to email them yourself and ask for it and tell them it's hard to believe it's accurate otherwise. Here's another question I had for our guide Horvick. It involves the poll paid for by the Betsy Johnson campaign. One of the questions asked voters how favorably they viewed the candidates. It asked if they would rather vote for a progressive Democrat, a qualified common sense independent, or a devout Trump Republican, which I'm pretty sure does not accurately define Christine Drazen, but she's the only Republican in the race and it does seem to slant the question against her. But as you can see, the results are shown to represent that Kotek and Drazen have unfavorable images and have a narrow appeal to ideological extremes. So, so this is, there's nothing wrong with a candidate testing a description of their opponent and to see if that's going to resonate with voters. Now, if they then use that information to to then sort of talk about their opponent or talk about themselves if they're testing sort of language about themselves as well. That's legitimate. Trying to pass that off as a neutral description is, you know, voters should look at that and be real critical and it would be appropriate to say, hey, I don't, I don't think that that's an accurate description or I think that, you know, there's, there's ways that Christine Drazen is going to talk about herself that's going to be more attractive to voters or Tina Kotek or Betsy Johnson. So candidates do that all the time and that's appropriate to learn how a frame, how a phrase, how a message might resonate. But you should be really clear when you're communicating those poll results about what you're doing. So far, we've learned that there is some guesswork in polling because they have to make an educated guess on who's going to actually vote in November. And then it's important to see who made up the sample of people that they talked to, that they polled. Another thing to keep in mind, those of us in the media should be asking for earlier polls. Did they do something two months ago? And you can email as well and ask the campaigns them th that thing. The other thing you should 
just be asking if you're going to follow up with a candidate, particularly if you're in the media, about a survey is, is this the only survey you've done? Have you done previous ones? What did those show? Why are you releasing this now? I mean, a candidate, again, might choose to release a survey at a time when they need to pivot the sort of the narrative or the news sort of coverage about them in a particular direction. And, you know, they may only release the surveys that are more favorable to them. So if they're, they've done several and, and, and some of them have been unfavorable toward them, and then one by random chance, because there's going to be some random chance in polling, shows them doing a little bit better, if that's the one they choose to show, that may or may not be reflective of what their electorate said. So, you know, asking them, what else have you done? And what else, what else maybe have you done that's not as positive as what you're, you're putting out today? The other thing to keep in mind is that margin of error. That's the little plus and minus sign on the polls that tell you the numbers could be off by 4% or whatever. The bigger the sample size, the more people they talk to, the more accurate the poll is and the lower that number should be. Well, that was a lot deeper dive than I expected when I first started putting that information together today. But I hope it is helpful to you. Now you know what to look for when these new polls come out. Things like how big is the sample size? What's the makeup of the voters? What was the wording of the questions? It all matters. And while we're talking about the governor's race and politics, there's been a bit of hardball played recently by the Democrats and the Republicans, hoping to dent the image of Betsy Johnson, who could steal votes from both. The mud is definitely flying. Republicans sent out a press release recently, which seemed to dig up as much dirt as they could find. It highlighted an ethics violation by Johnson back in 2007, and also a traffic crash in 2013, where Johnson slammed into another driver in Scapoos at a red light. Johnson ended up in a wheelchair for six months, and the other driver was seriously hurt as well. Willamette Week recently discovered that Johnson and her lawyer tried to claim legislative immunity to keep the other driver from suing her. Johnson said she was driving to Salem for the legislature at the time of the crash, and according to the Oregonian newspaper, her lawyers argued state taxpayers should be on the hook for the $260,000 lawsuit against her. A source in the campaign today told me, the Johnson campaign, that they settled the suit for $43,000 and that no taxpayer money was used. Democrats were also quick to highlight that crash that we're talking about. In fact, I even got a call last week from a member of the Tina Kotek campaign asking, hey, how come you're not covering this? We think it's big news. Yes, I'm sure you do. And now the Betsy Johnson camp is firing back at Kotek, highlighting the fact that she signed a million dollar settlement three years ago to end sexual harassment complaints by several women who worked at the state capitol. Taxpayers did foot the bill on that one. The complaints focused on a senator who has since resigned. Kotek was not directly involved, but she and Senate President Peter Courtney were criticized for not doing enough to prevent or stop the harassment. Yes, it is getting nasty. And yes, that's how it works in big time politics statewide, plus or minus 4%. Well, I don't have time to do a scientific poll with you, but I would love to see what you think about anything we just covered. Shoot me an email. The address is thestory at kgw.com or call and leave a voicemail. Our number is 503-226-5090. I look forward to hearing from you. Are you feeling overwhelmed by everything happening on Earth? Here's something that will either help or give you an existential crisis. Take a moment to stare into the vastness of our universe, courtesy of the new photos from NASA. And if you're wondering what all those smudges are, well, we've got the answers with Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino. He's going to fill us in when the story continues.
Welcome back. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. One of the comments we've already received is about a light back here right under that picture that there it is blinking. Yeah. Yeah, we know it's there. We didn't know before the show, but thanks for letting us know and we'll have the engineers take care of it. So just focus. You could also give us a call, leave a voicemail at 503-226-5090. Well, by now, I'm sure you've seen this new image from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's the deepest look into our universe yet. But if you're wondering what exactly all that means, you're not alone. I'm right there with you. Let's bring in a man who actually has an asteroid named after him. How cool is that? Chief Meteorologist Matt Zafino. Matt, what are we looking at here? Yeah, thanks so much, Pat. You know what? The, the, the time scales and the distance scales are so vast, it, it can be really hard to wrap your brain around it. So we'll try to give you a little perspective on that. First of all, the telescope itself, this is an artist's rendition of what it looks like once deployed in space. This was launched like six months ago, so it took a long time to get into position. And these are the solar panels out here. This is created by NASA and the Goddard Space Flight Center. And this is about 40 feet long. That's about 60 feet long. The whole thing weighs about 15,000 pounds. So, you know, this is not your backyard telescope, not at all. This is, and the reason you wanna have a telescope in space like we did with the Hubble is because you just do away with all the light pollution, all the other things in the atmosphere that can get in the way. And it allows us to peer deeper and deeper into the universe and see things that we literally have never seen before, never been seen before by human eyes. So that's why this is so important. Plus with the advances in technology, we're getting clearer, crisper images, things that are so old, I mean, that will literally help scientists discover how the universe, how the universe formed. But it's also just super cool. I mean, you see the stars, you see these things of light, and you're going, okay, what about it? Well, if you zoom in, and you can do this, you can download these images yourself and zoom around. Like, look at this thing, look at that. Now, to my eye, that looks like a storm. I mean, it looks like a hurricane. It would be a southern hemisphere hurricane because it's rotating, it would be rotating that way. But nonetheless, that's a galaxy. And so the distances here, you know, I'm covering it with my hand. That's like millions of miles across. So think about that. Think about where this telescope is, how far away from Earth it is. And it's looking at something that's millions of miles across and it's making it look that small. So super cool stuff to see there. So that one caught my eye. There was another one that was orange farther north. But then this floppy looking thing also caught my eye. That's like a galaxy on its side because we're just looking at 2D images and of course space is 3D. So this is a galaxy that's coming towards the camera, towards you and away from you. And then all these stars, some of which are, are millions of light years away. And remember a light year is a distance, not a measure of time. It's the time it takes light to travel one year and light travels at 186,000 miles a second. So the distances are massive. So the images are super cool. You can see things that we've never seen before. They're like that. Couple more images for you. I mean, look at the clarity on this. I don't even know what that is, but there's a star in the middle of it, some nebula, some galaxy there. And then finally, I'm going to show you uh, just a couple points on this, what we will see from this uh, James Webb Space Telescope. New galaxies, we're already seeing that, and we're just getting started with this because we're just getting the first images in the last couple of weeks. And I also uh, understand that we may see planets that actually have water, that may have breathable atmospheres. Imagine that. I mean, we didn't even, we didn't know those exist, but now we actually be able to see them with this telescope. And it'll really help us to understand the origins of our solar system, how we got here. So again, Pat, it is a little bit mind bending to think about this, the time and the distances and all of that, but the clarity of these images is really cool. However, I must say, you may be wondering, who was James Webb, right? And why did he get this rad telescope named after him? Well, he was the administrator of NASA back in the 60s when we did the big push to get uh, people on the moon. And that's why he got the telescope named after him. However, it is not without controversy. Uh, there were some astronomers who wanted it and so space scientists who wanted this uh, telescope named after an actual astronomer. That didn't happen. They were disappointed. And also Mr. Webb was implicated in something called the Lavender Scare, which was an effort by the federal government back in the 50s and 60s to purge LBGTQ, LBGTQ uh, individuals from the agency. So there is a little bit of controversy over the naming of this telescope, but still the images are remarkable. Back to you. Thank you, Matt. We'll try and forget about the name and focus on the images because they are spectacular. They are. Thank you so much. Still ahead, we're remembering Oregon Governor and Senator Mark Hatfield on what would have been his 100th birthday. This represents 
one of the most unique of all developments of business enterprises in the entire world. We're going to open the KGW vault when the story continues. Today would have been the 100th birthday of a very influential figure in Oregon politics, Senator Mark Hatfield. I met him a few times. He was very impressive. Hatfield represented Oregon in Congress for 30 years, and before that, he was governor. Hatfield died in 2011 at the age of 89. But before he passed, KGW put together a look at his life and career. Let's go into the vault with reporter Walden Kirsch. The date, August 3, 1960. The event, a formal celebration to mark the opening of Portland's brand new Lloyd Center. Among those bursting with civic pride, Oregon's boyish looking governor, Mark Hatfield. This represents one of the most unique of all developments of business enterprises in the entire world. But Mark Hatfield's career trajectory would take him far beyond shopping center ribbon cuttings. Mark Hatfield, um, has been the most effective national representative that Oregon has produced in the 20th century. Over a span in public life that stretched 44 years, Oregonians would literally watch Mark Hatfield grow old. But he made some of his marks early on. At the start of the 1950s, Portland was still a legally segregated city. Blacks were barred from many public services. Oregon, in many ways, still resembling the Jim Crow South. As a freshman state senator, Mark Hatfield pressed hard for black civil rights. Uh, that could have been a career killer for him, to take on an issue that controversial. To give the President of the United States sufficient time. As U.S. Senator, Mark Hatfield often raised hackles, voted his conscience, angered both the left and the right. The war in Vietnam during the 1960s and early 70s elevated Mark Hatfield to national, even international prominence as a pacifist. As the Vietnam War ground on, Republican Mark Hatfield continued to call for its halt. In 1970, with young people in open revolt at Portland State University and, of course, nationwide, Hatfield sought to abolish the draft. He was a risk taker. 
His opposition was not popular. It did not rest well with his party. The Nixon administration wanted to fall into line and he failed to do so. What's interesting about Hatfield is that he was able to still keep friends with conservative, moderate, liberal sources. So irritated was Richard Nixon, however, he would secretly include Mark Hatfield on his infamous enemies list. Back home, Hatfield helped steer the Columbia Gorge into scenic protection, assisted Indian tribes, and over the years, funneled federal construction dollars here, totaling into the many billions. He projected confidence, he projected uh, intelligence, uh, he spoke with heart and head. Those are remarkable talents for a politician. After failing in the 1940s to become his school's student body president, Mark Hatfield would never again lose an election. Oregon voters did not always agree with Mark Hatfield's views. For 44 years, though, they always knew what kind of a leader they were getting. That was Walden Kirsch. Keep sending your questions and comments to the story at KGW.com. Still ahead, how you can help our community. For this week's Hey Help campaign, we're asking you to donate to Harper's Playground. They're a Portland-based organization that builds playgrounds that are accessible to everyone, including kids with disabilities. So if you'd like to donate, just open up your camera on your phone right now and point it at the QR code on your screen there. Or you can go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. This is a micro donation drive, so feel free to give any amount, no matter how small or how big. That's the end of our show. Thanks so much for watching. Remember the story, our story, well, that never ends. I'll see you tomorrow.